Welcome to this sixth Sunday of Easter online service from St. Columbus Church in Ennis with the churches of Kilnasula and Christ Church Spanish Point. We are delighted that you are spending this time with us and we hope and pray that you and all your loved ones remain happy, safe and well. Well, we continue to live through these days of isolation and lockdown, separated from one another and from our churches. But we can also reflect that we are more than just our buildings. Much as we value them, it is our prayer together and our loving concern for one another that keeps us together and keeps us strong. We follow the service of the word booklets that you can see and download on the website. You can also view or download and print the pew sheet for this Sunday, which includes some suggested hymns on YouTube. The links have a choir and lyrics for you to sing along to. So please feel free to pause this service from time to time if you'd like to include the hymns. And so we start our service. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. And together we say, One thing have I asked of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to seek him in his temple. Who is it that you seek? We seek the Lord our God. Do you seek him with all your heart? We seek him with all our heart. Lord, have mercy. Do you seek him with all your soul? We seek him with all our soul. Lord, have mercy. Do you seek him with all your mind? We seek him with all our mind. Lord, have mercy. Do you seek him with all your strength? We seek him with all our strength. Christ, have mercy. And so we say together, Christ is a light, illumine and guide me. Christ is a shield, overshadow and hold me. Christ below me, Christ above me, Christ beside me on my left and my right. This day be within and around me, lowly and meek, yet all-knowing, all-powerful. Christ is a light, Christ is a shield, Christ be with me on my left and my right. And so we pray. O God, you have prepared for those who love you joys beyond our understanding. Pour into our hearts such love for you that, loving you above all else, we may obtain your promises that exceed all we can desire. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, for ever and ever. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I find among them an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything in it. He who is Lord of heaven and earth does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live, 
so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him. For indeed, he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own prophets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he have, has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Here ends the reading. Now hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus said to his disciples, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said to his disciples, If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. The Holy Spirit is of the three persons in the Trinity the most enigmatic, the most difficult to describe, and perhaps the most dangerous. The perplexing qualities of the Spirit allow the unscrupulous or merely the beguiled to appropriate the Spirit to justify almost any action. Various factions within the Church and wider Christianity can all attach the Spirit to their political agenda. If one argues the retort is, I have been led by the Spirit. This, of course, is often used as an unanswerable argument. To disagree is either to question the validity of their religious experience and devotion, or worse, to deny God's very purposes. This is in spite of the fact that one supposes all sides in a debate feel that the Spirit of God is totally with them. This, of course, threatens to lead us into a quagmire in which we are so bogged down with the competing claims of the individual that we fail to hear the genuine voice of God in our affairs. The early church was itself puzzled and troubled by the Spirit and unable to make much in the way of theological sense of this area of doctrine. And even today the Holy Spirit is an area fraught with competing interpretations. 
I would suggest that part of the problem lies in the fact that it is difficult, perhaps impossible, to view the spirit without placing it simultaneously within the context of the Trinity. And this is how Jesus speaks of the Spirit, the Advocate, in our passage today. If you honour God, Jesus tells his disciples, and if you continue to love me, then after I am gone, we shall not be completely parted. He tells them that in going away they will not feel orphaned, or abandoned, or be lost, hopeless and directionless, but they will continue to feel his life, his vitality, his inspiration and his loving guidance in their own lives. Just as the Father and he are one, says Jesus, so too the Spirit of Truth will remain in endless presence and relationship with those who continue to seek him. So what is the Holy Spirit? How might we recognize it? How might our lives be touched, shaped and directed by the Spirit? Where do we start to take on the awesome responsibility of discerning quite where the Spirit may be leading us? Well, first of all, I would say that we need a huge dose of humility how are we to tell whether one path or another is the right one to follow, whether one is serving God's purpose or merely getting in the way? And what we even mean by purpose, those of us who hold less to the idea of God as a being, and instead that the word God refers to the very ground of all being itself. How does that eternal reality have intention in a way that is not merely a projection of human desires. There is a phrase that St Anselm used a thousand years ago, it's well known, at least in theological circles, which I admit can be a little rarefied, but it is worth looking at. Credo ut in taligam goes the expression. Well, the root of the word credo crops up in many words we use today. For example, to give credence to, to be credible, to credit something, credentials. All associated in one way or another with the idea of conviction, acceptance, belief. And so the expression has conventionally been understood to translate as credo ut intelligam, I believe in order to understand. It sort of implies that you have to have faith to understand faith, and on one level that makes sense. After all, it is a lived experience. But there is the danger that credo can also imply credulous. It might mean and some seem to suppose that we have to leave our brains, our questions and uncertainties at the entrance to the church. We have to have unquestioning, literalistic, blind faith for faith to be worthy of the name. But as the theologian Karen Armstrong has pointed out, there is perhaps a better way to translate the Latin word credo, much more in keeping with the meaning of its time. Anselm was before the Enlightenment, before the scientific method began to dominate our way of thinking, especially in the last century or two. Before the time when all too often the churches felt that they had to abandon the more mystical, poetic and analogical interpretations of the past and compete instead with science by appearing equally rational, black and white, to the latter. In many ways, the bi biblical literalism of some Christians today 
is a relatively new obsession rooted in 19th century insecurity. Karen Armstrong argues that translating, mistranslating the word credo as to believe conveys the erroneous connotation of believing a set of facts to be true. As when we say we believe that an event happened in a particular way, we believe that someone was there and did something. In other words, belief understood as a statement about facts and knowledge. Whereas in Anselm's day, the word credo meant something quite different. It was closer to words such as commit or to engage with, to pledge oneself. Seen in this light, the phrase credo or tintaligam gives us a powerful insight about how to discern the presence and the guidance of the spirit. Credo ut intelligam, meaning I commit, I pledge myself, I engage with in order to understand. It doesn't mean that we necessarily accept everything we are taught without question that we are intimidated and silenced by words like dogma or tradition and orthodoxy. But instead, we engage ourselves, our hearts and our minds, with the stories we have been told, the community in which we have been placed, and the context in which we now live. We work at it, we think, we pray, we debate, we question, we accept, and we reject. We hold fast to some, and we let go of some. But above all, we get stuck in. Socrates once said that the unexamined life is not worth living. I might add that the unexamined faith is hardly worth having. For left unattended, unconsidered, it will simply atrophy and die, honoured only by force of habit. And so that brings us back to the oh-so-difficult task of recognising the spirit in our lives. How are we then to judge? In his letter to the Galatians, chapter 5, Paul's Paul gives us wise advice about discerning the Spirit. Advice that is as true today as it ever was when he speaks of the fruits of the Spirit. Signs, essential signs that the Spirit is at work. Indeed, if they are ever absent, it seems pretty clear that the Spirit is not in play. And he says, by contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. There is no law against such things. Indeed. So then, we must examine our consciences and decide whether our actions are calculated to build up love in our hearts, in those of others, and in our community. Self-giving love that seeks the well-being of others. Do we seek to increase joy in those around us? Are we letting go with flashes of anger, or do we seek peace? Not only with those we like, but perhaps especially with those we find it more difficult to like. Are we patient and kind, 
generous, faithful, gentle of heart and action and speech? Do we hold back from advancing our own comfort and instead seek the comfort of others? The Holy Spirit is surely to be found in all these things. A loving, gentle spirit that seeks to bring love, joy and peace to each one of us, to our community and to our world that is in such desperate need of all these things. Or to recognize the Spirit, we have to live in the Spirit. To understand, we have to live it to make our lives a living prayer with no particular agenda, no list of demands for God to listen to, no preconceptions or fixed ideas to seek approval for. Simply that we pray for the Holy Spirit to guide us and lead us so that we might possess some small part of the wisdom and humility necessary to hear that silent voice in our hearts calling us to the fruits of the Spirit, calling us to love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Let us pledge ourselves to it and one day we might understand. Amen. So let us now declare our faith together. We believe in God the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us now pray for our church, for ourselves and neighbours, and for the needs of the whole world. Lord, you have promised to be with us forever, your Spirit ever in us and through us. Free us from all anxiety. Give us the courage to live our faith, to live our questions our uncertainties and our strivings. May they be a part of our faith, a way of engaging and committing and one day understanding. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all who are struggling in lonely and difficult places, for all who feel forgotten and forsaken. We pray for countries where laws are flouted, human rights abused, the vulnerable targeted and exploited. We pray for all who wish to live in simplicity, gentleness and reverence and for all who suffer in the cause of justice and equality. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are captives to superstition and fear, for those who have no knowledge of you, for those whose lives are empty or filled with the wrong things. 
We remember before you all those whose lives are broken, those falling into darkness or sickness, that each in moments of despair and weakness may know your strength. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks for all those in our society who devote themselves to the well-being of others, for hospital staff, GPs, and local nurses and caregivers, for those who are staff in residential homes and carers for loved ones in their own homes. In these strange days of isolation, we give thanks for all those who in our shops, services and other enterprises have kept our society open and going. Give wisdom to policy makers, administrators and leaders, comfort and encouragement to healthcare professionals and researchers, solace to everyone in distress, and a sense of calm to us all in these days of uncertainty and distress. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, you have gone before us and prepared a place for us. We remember all those who have died in these recent days as we light a candle in our hearts to honour them and entrust them to God's mercy and loving welcome. May they fly straight home into the dwelling places of peace. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ for whom love was stronger than death. Amen. And together we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. O God, make clear to us each road. Make safe to us each step. When we stumble, hold us. When we fall, lift us up. When we are hard pressed, deliver us and bring us at last to your glory. And may the living God remove the shroud that lies upon our world. May the risen Saviour draw the sting of death, bringing all to life in him. May the flowing Spirit set us and all creation free and seal our hearts with faith. And the blessing of God, Almighty Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you and all those whom you love this day and every day. Amen. Let us go in the peace of the risen Christ. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia.